Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 737. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 21st, 2022. All right, welcome to another program. And you're here because we're here, we're here because you're here. It's a paradox. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're new to the program and we see we new, new viewers every week, this is where Kevin and George, I'm Kevin Coulson, a lay person from the ACNA, and George Conger is a priest in the Episcopal Church. He's based out of Florida. I live at uh, RV full-time, traveling North America. And this is a show that just works. Is either of us gifted in what we do? No. When I started Anglican TV 12, 13 years ago, I didn't even own a camera. So it just works. And we, we, we're very happy that God uses this form and that God can use George and Kevin to give you the news. And we try to speak the news in a very transparent way. Um, we are biased. We both have a God bias. And we're both biased because we think things are redeemable. We don't see the hopelessness. Um, uh, as ultimate hopelessness. When we see something that's uh, hard to watch and hard to know, we pray for it and we pray for its transformation. And when we have good stories, we like to report them. And we have a very good story this week, George, starting with the 50th anniversary of Gomez's uh, uh, clergy bishopship. Drexel Gomez, mm -hmm. the uh, retired Archbishop of the West Indies, this Sunday will celebrate his 50th anniversary of being consecrated a bishop. He, uh, Drexel, if you don't know him, was one of the leaders of the Anglican Conservative and Renewal Movement for 20 plus years until he stepped down as Archbishop of the West Indies about 10 years ago. And he was elected, he was the principal of Codrington College in Barbados. He's Bahamian national and was elected Bishop of Barbados 50 years ago and then was translated to his home of Nassau where he became Bishop of Nassau in the Bahamas. Archbishop Gomez was the one who coined the phrase to tear the fabric, the Anglican communion. Mm -hmm. He really was an outs is an outstanding leader. I'm going to be writing an article about uh, him for Anglican Inc. and George Carey and Foley Beach have kindly given me little messages to include in the story, but the church does raise up leaders in the time of need, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, just imagine if Drexel Gomez had been the Archbishop of Canterbury these years instead of the Archbishop of the West Indies. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to put down the West Indies, but the point is that if... Here is somebody from the Berry Islands in Bahamas, not even from Nassau originally, the Berry Islands, one of the out islands, who rose to such heights through personal intelligence, charisma, faithfulness. God used him to change the church and to make this a better place. Oh, if only this, if only we had men like him in leadership in the uh, American church and the Anglican, English church, and Canadian church. It'd be a great, great place. Well, he did a wonderful job where he was, and uh, it's it's nice to look back in those 50 years and see the fruit of his ministry uh, in the mm -hmm. islands. And, um, you know, it's just a pleasant place and a, a wonderful place where the gospel has continued all this time. Um, and you're right, he coined the phrase, and I was at the uh, one of the conferences, uh, and he gave that phrase at the Kenya Cathedral uh, at the consecration of... Bishop uh, Murdoch and Bishop, uh, who was the other bishop at the time? John Guernsey. Uh, John Guernsey was the one over in Uganda. Um, out of Texas. Bill Atwood? There you go, Bill, Bill Atwood. Atwood. <laughs> Jeepers, George. We, 50 years is a long time ago, George. I can't remember everything. And so you just, uh, it, it's just wonderful to see the fruits of that ministry even spread out uh, beyond the borders of, of uh, Gomez's home area. That's a great story. Let's move on to some more news. Um, uh, and I hate to, to, to report on this one because it's the, the Charles Bronson uh, classic. Uh, every bad guy is an L.A. pimp. Every good guy is a white uh, L.A. cop. And these are the shows of the 70s. 
And now the Church of England is, is making that point over in England where every black person who doesn't agree with them and who's an outsider is a pimp, George, and they're calling Calvin Robinson a pimp. This is this is seventies Hollywood all over again. Calvin Robinson, as we've reported in the past, is an up-and-coming leader of conservative thought in the UK. He's on GB television mm -hmm. as a commentator. He's gone through the ordination process in the Church of England and was refused because of his traditional views. And he's now moved over to the Free Church of England and is going to be working with the GAFCON community. Calvin is no dummy, far from it. And he's been able to expose the inner workings of the Church of England in their rebuke to him towards ordination, uh, telling him that as a black man, he doesn't understand racism as well as a white middle-aged woman that was the Bishop of London. Uh, that uh, Pete Broadbent, the former Bishop of Willesden, you know, got his oar in, uh, just be being nasty and officious and basically being anything but Christian in his treatment of uh, Calvin Robinson. And now amongst the bishops, uh, there's uh, messages passing back and forth that saying that Calvin, who has a large afro uh, that can, no, can be he, seen he, by satellites he, in space. He got it cut off this week. I saw a picture on Twitter. He got the afro cut off. And now I, I miss that. that one of the cute. Well, he, he, had, he had a things. super fly. He yeah. had a super fly afro. <laughs> And this shows you the ways the minds work of the British bishops. They're calling him a pimp in their private conversations. I mean, he, there's a little, it sort of shows the massive hypocrisy and as well as insular nature of the leaders of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. oh, there's uh, some flaps in England about uh, immigration policy and whatnot that's not really that interesting to people outside of England. Um, in England, uh, they have problems with immigrants from the developing world crossing the channel from France to England because welfare benefits are better in England than in France. And they claim to be asylum seekers. Well, why don't they just stay in France? Well, that's another issue. But the British government has introduced a scheme to basically take these asylum seekers and send them to uh, camps in Rwanda uh, that they had the church, the English government has built to sort of sort out who's an asylum seeker, who's genuinely afraid of their life, who is just somebody who wants a better life and make more money and just wants to get out of the small town and move to the golden island of England. Well, the British bishops have uh, in lockstep denounced the government saying this is immoral, horrible, uh, racist, all this and that. Now, the Archbishop of Rwanda, Laurent Mabanda, has saying making people go to Rwanda is a racist thing. Uh, I think you guys need to sort of rethink that. Uh, uh, reason number 512 why I'm not coming to Lambeth. <laughs> but they say all people are welcome in England, in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. except, and here's the rejoinder, except for Calvin Robinson. Uh, I, Justin Welby, I get his Twitter feed on my uh, computer and uh, the, the tweets he makes and he had this long sh long song and dance about all are welcome we don't hold anybody out and then he's talking about the Lambeth conference saying oh well the bishops can't tell anybody what to do we can only offer our views and opinions suggestions the immediate next suggestions the immediate immediate next tweet from Justin Welby was the British government must do this on Rwanda because it's immoral Okay, when dealing with the Episcopal Church in America and homosexuality, we'll let people find their own way. We can Absolutely. only advise, yeah, come on, yeah. but yeah. we can tell the British government what to do. And yeah. we can basically have a culture where we're going to call young black conservatives pimps because they aren't uh, people who uh, think the way we want them to. I would say that the Church of England would be okay with all the clergy and bishops around the world telling people what to do if the message was be your best self if that were the single message and it is certainly from the church of england just be your best self and that's not the message of the gospel in fact that is inherently anti-gospel and uh, certainly the realms of <clears throat> the enemy and it's interesting to see 
the Church of England go through this this white man's amalgamation of what Hollywood was in the 70s. And I'm of the age where I would watch The Death Wish by Charles Bronson and all those little Hollywood cliche uh, vigilante movies where the white man was always the good one and three black hooligans were always the bad people. And that's that's how Hollywood made their money and Hollywood made their flicks. And then one day Hollywood would wake up, well, why does everybody hate black people? We don't. You do. <laughs> you know? And, oh, jeez. Well, part of... And- there's a knock-on effect. There's a personal effect where a good man is being maligned by people who should know better, who should have a higher moral sense than to repeat malicious, false things. Calvin Robinson is no pimp. Far from it. No. <laughs> but, for instance, during the Brexit debate, whether the England should be part of the European Union, UK should be part of the European Union, only one bishop publicly was in favor of leaving and every other bishop was in favor of the what the elites wanted being part of the eu uh there's a recent poll only six percent of the british clergy church of england clergy voted for the conservative party the ruling party in power the overwhelming majority support the labor party so now after this latest uh bout of uh bishops like alan wilson the bishop of buckingham and uh, the Bishop of Leeds, uh, Nick Baines, calling for Boris Johnson to, to, to resign. Funny how they didn't call for other people to resign over anti-Semitism and things mm-hmm. like that, but whatever. Just the, there are now magazine articles appearing saying, why is the Church of England the Labour Party at prayer? Do they not want conservatives to come to church? We had that Welsh bishop, uh, who basically denounced the Conservative Party, even though her diocese, the MPs from that region, are members of the Conservative Party. They're so out of touch. They're so cloistered in their own worlds. And really, the worst thing that's happened, I think, that politically, uh, Gordon Brown was Prime Minister after uh, of England after uh, Tony... Tony and Brown. one of the things yeah. Gordon Brown did, Gordon Brown was the son of a Presbyterian minister, but he was also an atheist. And he said to the, and that tradition had been that when a bishop came up, his name was given to the prime minister, and the prime minister picked. Gordon Brown said, I don't want to be bothered. Church of England, you just present people, and I'll just pass it on to the queen. What that meant was that the inner circle of the Church of England had no check. The government, you know, uh, there's stories that cannot be confirmed, but the when uh, a, a choice was made for Archbishop of Canterbury, Margaret Thatcher did not choose that choice and picked George Carey instead. Uh, there's no check to the wokery of the British bishops by the people in the form of Parliament. Um, and we now see that writ large with a monochrome uh, woke mindset that is just accelerating the decline of the Church of England. When it will finally collapse, is, I don't know. Well, there's certainly no God check in it. You know, here in America, we uh, choose our bishops by uh, majority vote from uh, the clergy and the laity of the diocese electing the, uh, uh, the bishop. Uh, he, certainly within the ACNA, the Episcopal Church has done it for a while, and it's so much different over in England where it's chosen by it, it, he or she is chosen by a committee, and that committee puts the name forward, and all of a sudden, you, you're part of a diocese, oh, I have a new bishop, you know, it, 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 he wasn't part of our diocese before, to get a meeting, you have a walkthrough, and it's done completely different, and you can see the results. You know, one day uh, the church wakes up and says, "Well, why aren't we Christian anymore?" Well, you, where are you at? Because we don't have Christian, le- we don't have Christian leadership. Yeah, you know, I, I, you, it's like you know, Hollywood wakes up and finds out it's racist. Well, you, you weren't paying attention, you know. So, uh, keep Calvin in your prayers. Um, he's certainly doing some amazing work over in England. He's getting great attention from those who it matters and that's the uh the lay people and the the people in the community i don't care whether or not the church likes calvin or not i care that he is spreading the gospel on the shores of the uk 
Um, George, there's some money missing, and you and I need to talk about this because um, I'm horrible with my billfold. Uh, I, I live in an RV, so every day I have to take the, my billfold with me to the car. Sometimes I leave it in the car. Uh, every day I go for a bike ride, so I put my, my, my billfold at the back of my jersey and I zip it up. At any one time, I do not know where my billfold is for hours on end. And if I lose it, I will probably lose three or four dollars. Twenty if I hit the ATM the day before. So it, it, it's a constant thing to know where my billfold is. And I was surprised that somebody down in South Africa lost uh, their money. And I was equally surprised, or greatly or surprised, by the amount of money they lost. Where I would lose three or four dollars, this person lost millions. And it seems there's some corruption going on, and we need to talk about it. <laughs> Cyril, I think it's Ramfosa, the president of South Africa, as a country estate. And as Kevin said, he left his wallet on the dresser, went to bed, woke up in the morning, it was gone. Somebody stole his wallet. Well, we're being silly, but some, there was a robbery at his home and several million dollars of cash was stolen. Um, which raises the question, what is the president doing with millions of dollars in cash? Yeah. Now, if you watch T gang, you know, you watch these robbery shows or bank heists and whatnot, mm -hmm. I think you'll try to get under several million dollars worth of cash is like a pallet of cash. I mean, it's it's not one little black bag that you run out of the bank with. Uh, the Archbishop of Cape Town is basically saying, "What we need to look into this." Uh, there have been calls by the opposition in South Africa saying, "This is prima facie evidence of corruption." People just and or tax evasion at the very least. People just don't have that much cash uh, under their mattresses, especially if they're the president. And with the Anglican, uh, Anglican, the African National Congress (ANC) party with a history of terrible corruption and cronyism, we really need to have this investigated. So, the Archbishop of Cape Town is actually starting to do a good thing without naming names, without you know pointing fingers at individuals. He's really calling the gup, the uh, police, and the government to basically police themselves. And uh, South Africa right now is a failing state. Oh, Massive yeah. unemployment, flight, uh, problem with immigration, problem with Crime. the utilities don't work. I mean, the electrical cut off. Mm -hmm. um, it's the cities are grinding to a halt in some places. The Cape Province is still doing very well because the Cape Province government, Western Cape, is not the ANC. No, and so they're it's all, holding it's, their own. It's a bit brutal. <laughs> you know, you don't you could, don't commit crime there and not uh, uh, sustain uh, damage. So, but the it, it's like I hate to say this, but uh, South Africa is turning into Camden, New Jersey, or Washington D.C., or Benton Harbor, Michigan, or Detroit. They're allowing a once great nation because of political corruption and incompetence to fall all apart around them. Yeah. And I wanted to encourage presiding Bishop Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church here in America, to investigate crime and corruption here. There's the son of a president who can sell artwork to a communist country, uh, basically a, a off the record enemy of America and make millions of dollars. And that's weird, don't you think, George? Or this, mm. this, this same son can have uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, fuel deals with pla places in Ukraine and uh, be sure that his father, whoever that may be, is involved in the deal. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe the presiding bishop here in, in our small little country of America could also do some investigation. Uh, just saying. But it's interesting to see that... Uh, well, uh, the, the press is starting to wake up. The press uh, is. At, a, uh, at a recent press conference, the White House, I think, well, I think it was Fox News, mm -hmm. or might have been uh, one of the other networks, asked the new press secretary um, why all these Russian oligarchs are being uh, banned or had sanctioned, and, and including 
the patriarch Kirill of patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. They can't visit the West, their bank accounts, their homes, everything, anything that can be touched in the West because of their support of the invasion is being seized by the governments. Uh, one oligarch whose stuff is not being touched just happens to be the wife of the late uh, mayor of Moscow who mm. gave Hunter, uh, gave somebody, somebody. Uh, $3 million a gift or a non-return, a loan that he didn't have to pay back. And this somebody happened to have a very influential father. This one person has not been sanctioned. Not at all. In and fact, it that probably was a well worth giving three million dollars to somebody. That's it. That so a, they can still. That was mm. a very cheap buy-off, um, and it, that that went to pay for somebody's legal fees and late IRS fees. So. Yeah. And the press officer, uh, the new press officer, uh, basically just stared deer in the headlights. Can't say anything about that. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. All right. Um. I'm currently in Madison, the Midwest. Uh, this is where I was brought up and raised in the congre congregational type churches here. Uh, my teenage years were spent in the UCC, and that's the United Church of Christ, and that was an early adopter of liberal policies here in the 70s and 80s. Uh, it was one of the first churches to fully endorse abortion uh, and have it part of its platform. And it was one of the first churches here uh, in America to raise the surrender flag. And when I say raise the surrender flag, I hope you know that we're talking about the rainbow flag uh, put up by the LGBTQ plus 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 people. And um, I see it more and more and more uh, around the counties here in uh, Wisconsin in our travels, and I see it more internationally. Ironically, the church that I came to faith in is still anti. LGBTQ, LCCT, and they have not raised the, the, the surrender flag. And the surrender flags now come up more and more in uh, some behind the scenes talk in the Church of England. Most churches there have raised the surrender flag, but there's pushback now, George. Luke Appleton, who is a member of General Synod, a lay delegate from uh, uh, South, uh, I've forgotten the dice, Exeter, Exeter. Uh, has introduced a private member's motion asking that churches not fly political flags. There are a number of English cathedrals. This is Pride Month, and he put this resolution out during Pride Month, uh, maybe in response to all the cathedrals and all the churches now flying Pride flags from their flagpoles. Last, two years ago, it was BLM flags. Mm -hmm. And this political activism Luke is saying is really not appropriate for the Church of England. We should not be getting involved in issue politics supporting one side over another and having pride flags when actually the formularies and the st statements of the Church of England say what pride stands for, the Church of England doesn't stand for, mm -hmm. is offensive and we shouldn't do this. Now this will come up before General Synod uh, if it gets enough support to be debated. Uh, it's getting a lot of pushback by the gay activists saying, oh, we must do this. Well, what would happen if you've got uh, somebody putting up a MAGA flag you know, or a big Trump banner from an English church? Do you think people would say, oh, live and let live? Mm -hmm. No. If it, if it goes to, into the woke world of Black Lives Matter, of uh, the new gay and lesbian flag, uh, that's okay. I've seen photos of altar cloths with the rainbow flag. Um, what if we have altar cloths with a red red altar cloth for Pentecost with a hammer and sickle embroidered on it? I mean, is that okay? Well, it, or red altar cloth with uh, "Make America Great Again" embroidered on it? Is that okay? It wasn't too long ago. If you went to some places in the South, you could find something that said "Do not tread on me." Uh, as an altar cloth. I mean, and this is where the church needs to step back and say, we're not going to be a mouthpiece for these political um, uh, organizations. And you need to step back and say, um, let's investigate. If you're feeling shame, does the church teach that pride is the antidote or repentance is the antidote to shame? Yeah, let's let's look up some of these things we used to understand in the past. 
Well, at the same time, Kevin, we need to look at our own house, and there are so there are, is a wing of the ACNA, and certainly in the Episcopal Church, that has a conniption fit if they see an American flag uh, against the back wall. Uh, my church, I've got two flags uh, on the back wall, one up between the deacons and the the three chairs in the back for the clergy. One is an American flag and the Episcopal Church flag, and we've got a state of Florida flag somewhere. People complain about American flags and Americanism and nationalism, and there's a wing of the ACNA that says uh, that's uh, white nationalism, that's white uh, supremacy, white pride displaying the American flag in a church. I think that's ludicrous myself, ludicrous. and I don't, and because an American flag, just like the Union Jack in England, should be a symbol for all of us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exclude any of us. When I, I had a parish in Avon Park years ago, and during the winter, half the people were Canadian, and we put up a little maple leaf flag, a Canadian flag, not uh, in support of uh, whoever was prime minister at the time. It wasn't Justin Trudeau, but, uh, uh, but rather just as a sense of uh, who we are as a community. We're Americans and Canadians in this church. And that's, um, the, that's the part, that's the community part. We've been told now for uh, 10 or 15 years that our diversity is what uni unifies us, that it's our strength, that uh, being a diverse people, diverse colors is the power of the strength of America. And no, it, it's not at all. What unifies us is the Constitution, is the flag, our common history, our common goals as a nation. What unifies a common us is language. Our common language. It, it, what unifies us as a country is not what separates us it's it's these documents in history that we have together and when you want to take out and and completely sponge uh the, our unification uh that which holds us in common communion uh you are trying to undo america and you're lying when you say it's our um uh it's our color the skin color that unites us no that's that's silly you know we yeah, are and if diversity the flag. yeah and if diversity was such a hot idea, tell me why Yugoslavia was such an awful mess. Yes, sir. Serbs, Croats, Muslims, Albanians, mm -hmm. uh, Orthodox, Catholic, uh, friends, this diversity nonsense has been the destruction of countries, destruction of cultures. It's mm -hmm. not been a unification theory. Um, now, it's nonsense. Yeah, but, but, nonsense. Let's, but let's identify what diversity is diversity is our ethos and it is who we are it is not what holds us in common and we can't use individual diversity it. yes uh, absolutely well, we can't use the the diversity as something that we worship and that we call attention to the the, the wholeness of our diversity no 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 uh we are greatest as a nation when we all respond to 9 11. nobody of any uh diversity was not affected by 9-11. All colors, creeds in this nation turned to the flag, turned to the president, turned to the Constitution, and said, what do we do when evil attacks the borders of this nation? And they f that's where we became unified. When we become ununified is when we point out our diversity and uh, try to make all things uh, le legitimate under th the banner of diversity. It doesn't work. Well, I hate to say this, Kevin, but uh, whenever I hear these bub words, buzzwords of diversity, I just inwardly groan uh, because I know it's just can't language um, mm -hmm. because nobody believes it. You know, the Church of England is so keen on diversity, but look at the monochrome, monolithic thinking of its leadership sure. uh, or the universities in the United States. Oh, they're all in it for diversity. But how many conservative Republicans are faculty members at universities? I'm not. Well, academia's, academia is the last place that diversity of thought exists. Mm -hmm. Now, I go through here in Madison, kind of the, the Stalingrad of uh, Wisconsin here, and they all have those little placards in their front yards that says, this house believes that love is love and diversity is power, blah, 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 blah. And um, we honor diversity is one of the top lines. And I know, no, you don't. I have a diverse opinion 
on politics than you do. You do not honor my, my polity at all. You won't let me speak. You block my speech. You won't let me think and give out my views in public. And one day YouTube will finally shut up th this channel down. You do not believe in diversity at all. That is a lie. All you believe in is diversity of skin color. And I believe, I believe in diversity of skin color. But I also believe in diversity of opinion, thought, and diversity of culture and academia. And you don't. So... Well, Kevin, there is one thing you'll see more of in Madison than down in Webster, Florida. Yeah, oh, geez. <laughs> those coexist bumper stickers oh, with yeah. the, <laughs> the, the. Okay, Madison, Wisconsin is the virtual signaling capital of the world. Uh, everybody drives a Prius or a Honda Fit, and every uh, rear of those cars is, is surrounded by bumper stickers. I'm going to put a picture up that we took. Uh, it, in the farmlands, 50 miles from Madison, they still have these virtual signaling things. And it's a couple of them have scraped off places where they had the Biden uh, stickers. But other than that, they, they still believe what they believe. And uh, well, I, my children are like my children are part of that generation. Yeah, and mine too. Uh, we recently sent them to my pillows, uh, and uh, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> And they actually like them. They, they're actually <laughs> worth the money. Uh, but they don't tell their friends that they have a my pillow under oh. the uh, slip cover. Well, here, here, when I visit my kids, I say, hey, let's go to Chick fil A. Oh, we don't go there because they don't support the blah, 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 blah. Well, you see all the stuff here that is made in China in your apartment. It's actually against the law to be blah 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 in that country, and so it's just like, you know, the hypocrisy, the virtual signaling, the oh, uh, I'm a millennial, hear me roar, you know. So, oh, uh, George, let's uh, move on to some more news. Um, let's see. Oh, now you and I have talked about trying to uh, re-evangelize the shores of the UK, and Gafcon two was the announcement by Peter Jen Jensen that hey. Let's go into England and try to no longer restart the Church of England, but offer an alternative. And uh, Gafcon went in there, and over some fits and starts and uh, jumps, uh, and some, that didn't work, that didn't work, we won't do that again, not that way, that doesn't work. They're, they, they finally have some ground they're on. And they've had a consistent organization there for at least three, four years. And I thought we could draw attention to this because I got a press release that they, they got some more bishop. And uh, if, you're, you, if you're getting more bishops and you're, you're building more churches, maybe you have a chance of being a good alternative to the Church of England. Maybe. Yeah, I have the AMIE uh, recently announced that uh, two bishops had been appointed elected to be suffragans to Andy Lines. And the, the new suffragans are or assistant bishops. Mm -hmm are uh, Lee McMahon and uh, Tim Davies. And I think this is a good thing because uh, England is a big place for one person to try to support and cover. And if we have effective Episcopal leadership, that can make the difference in building a culture and an atmosphere amongst the clergy and lay leaders of excitement, growth, evangelism, vigor. Mm -hmm. um, and I just pray that uh, the AMIE has picked the right people at the right time to really carry forward that important work it's got to do. No, and I agree. I mean, we watched we watched it be the church of don't do the don't do it this way for you know almost ten years now. Now it's getting a foothold, and I, I really want to encourage it. Uh, if you guys want to get more information about it, I'll put a link to their website in the show notes um, so you can help and, and pray for this because uh, we talk really. Uh, loudly about the failures of the Church of England. We don't try to nitpick. These are just the big glaring failures of the Church of England. It's not like we're looking at the, the you know, taking apart a, a comma or two in a prayer book. There's some massive uh, hypocrisy and evil going on at, at the leadership level of the Church of England that we, we draw attention to. And we want to all draw attention as well to any alternatives that uh, may succeed. And AMIE, we hope, is one of those. Um, all right, let's talk about Lambeth. I hate to do it. Uh, I have made the executive decision that Kevin is not going to attend Lambeth 2022. Now, I'm not going to pay for a plane ticket. I'm not going to stay in an 
an air conditioned dormitory uh, in the outskirts of, of Kent. Uh, I'm just going to sit right here and watch from afar and see what happens because in the end, it'll be to, in my mind, another general convention where you, you they, they run bishops from room to room to room. There's no access to the press. They will give a general uh, press uh, conference in the morning, a uh, more elongated one in the evening, ex explain what they did. And all they're going to do, if given the chance, is give suggestions to the church. And all they're going to do is uh, become a little uh, two-week United Nations at Kent University in, uh, in England. And in a month, we, two months, we won't even be talking about it anymore. Well, there is a movement that we've received information about, uh, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, uh, which is, I don't want to say rival to GAFCON, but sort of a parallel organization. Parallel, yeah. their, their, leaders are go their leaders and their bishops are going to the Lambeth Conference. A group uh, affiliated with the Evangelical Fellowship of the Anglican Communion, EFAC, is working to resource the traditional-minded bishops. They claim that of the 600 bishops going, 400 will really be of the traditional mind. I think that might be a little high when you have 100 Episcopal bishops and you have uh, 60 English bishops and 30 Canadian bishops, but, well, we'll leave it there. Uh, the, the leaders of this are Henry Scriven, Paul Letty, uh, Charles Raven, all excellent men, sure. all leaders of the Ang evangelical world in England, and they're going to provide... Uh, in 1998, I was part of a team or led by the American Anglican Council and the Oxford Center for Mission Studies that resourced the Global South. In essence, there were parallel organizations. In other words, there's the official secretary of a group, and then there's the unofficial secretary of a group. Uh, representing the uh, GAFCON, uh, G well, Cam GAFCON, the, the Global South people. I, for instance, uh, typed Lesl Resolution Lambeth 1.10. Uh, I was the typist. I ran, got Chinese food at midnight. I got, I did all the stuff that a good soldier does for his officer. Now, there were oh, three, four dozen of us. And this time, in 1998, and part of the success of 98 was that there was a well-organized machine to beat the English bureaucrats who ran Lambeth. 2008, they locked us out. They had uh, chain link fences that prevented us from getting involved. And that's when they introduced Indaba so that no decisions could be reached, just endless chatting. This time around, they're going to even, it's going to be like visiting prison. Uh, almost no contact, no freedom of interaction with people in the press and the bishops. Kevin, you're right. Uh, you'll just all, you know, with the press conferences put on uh, on live streamed, what's the point of being there in person? And, um, and it's even worse than that, George, because when they consolidate and isolate and control uh, when these people eat, what they read, what they learn, it's like putting them into a little Lambeth cult for two weeks. And so mm -hmm. they become disor disorientated to the time of day, to what's happening, to where they need to be. And they're all following these little structures and being moved around. And so at the end of the day, they never had time to, to sit down and really talk and hash out the, the doctrinal issues that are missing in the leadership of the, the Church of England and missing in the leadership of the Anglican Communion. That they don't have time anymore to, to sit down and deal with that because they're running from one Indaba group to another suggestion group to another mosquito net group to another how to bring more money to your province group to another asinine group you know and one of the great things that i see in gafcon is they have bishop training they will take new bishops and they will have uh, individual or not individual group training for these uh, bishops to let them know what it means to be a bishop you have people running around this conference that the only thing that they know that they could do as a bishop is agree on the same color shirt to wear. Purple, by the way. And all else is chaos. And that's the way Lambeth wants it. And when Lambeth, which is the shorthand for the bureaucracy that runs this show, mm -hmm. um, they hate those with institutional memory. Mm -hmm. 
they count on the fact that 90% plus of those bishops there will never go into Lambeth before. They won't know any better. This is how the primates meetings have been controlled in the past, and that those primates that they've reached an agreement at this meeting, three years later, a third of them are gone, and nobody remembers what they agreed to. Uh, I, in essence, have been particularly singled out, where, you know, I'm repeatedly refused, uh, I'm dropped from email distribution lists, I'm refused credentials and things like that, because I have the ability to point out lies told by the leadership. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one lie. Lambeth 1.10, which is the statement on homosexuality, um, there are many, uh, many uh, uh, paragraphs to that. One paragraph deals with conversion therapy. It deals with, we believe that by prayer we can help people with this malady. Now, the Church of England and several other churches are going through these uh, somersaults trying to ban conversion therapy. General Synod has banned conversion therapy. Well, this is contrary to Lambeth 1.10. Well, they will tell you, no, it's not. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I was there. I typed it. I know. I talked to the people. What are you trying to say? What do you mean? And conversion therapy, meaning the power of the Holy Spirit, can change anybody. If you repent and seek to return to the Lord, the Lord will answer you. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to change people. Now, if you ask Justin Welby about conversion therapy, oh, he thinks it's terrible, it's bad, it's locking people up in psychiatric institutions and shocking them until they no longer are gay. No, Lambeth has already spoken on this issue. Mm -hmm. We believe that through prayer, people's lives can be changed. And now the Church of England has criminalized, effectively, prayer for people to change. I can call out a lie, because I was there. I know better. I participated. And they don't want people like that coming around ruining their party. Well, they go for longer memory. You know, we do remember back in the 80s, you know, certainly here in America, in Colorado, there were camps you could send your gay son or gay daughter to where they would, and, you know, and some would, you know, beat the gay out of them. Those, those are little conversion camps offered by the, the Southern Baptist uh, Church and others. Wicked, horrible. There are other places uh, that were certainly offered here in the Midwest where I have friends who struggle with gay identity, went to these camps, got counseling, got prayer. Nobody forced anything on them. They were taught the benefit and the godliness of having contrast in your life to have a male and female relationships and came out and my god it's been 30 years since i've seen four or five of these guys and i hang out with them and they have not gone back to their uh their desires before the camp it was a life-changing experience that was the gay was not beat out of them it was talked out of them it was showing that um there that the gay lifestyle is not a um, healthy alternative to the heterosexual married lifestyle and what the gay culture wants to teach you is that it is a healthy godly alternative and we're saying yeah not really yeah not from scripture not from science not from medicine not from history um, the only muse that really finds uh, gay culture edifying would be Broadway so you know, it, I, I have a different perspective because I have so many former gay friends uh, here in the Midwest. I have that diff different perspective. Some people have the perspective, well, I know a gay couple who have a loving, nurturing uh, marriage, and yeah, that's great. And wow, but that's not the majority of relationships, uh, of, the, of the gay relationship. The, the 1970s and the 1980s uh, revealed the struggles of having a uh, consistent monogamous homosexual relationship and you know, we gave to free love in our society here in America and in Europe and it just didn't take didn't take sorry oh I'm well, banned from YouTube now <laughs> so. the, the there were there were these camps that actually beat the gay into people. I'm thinking yes, of uh, John, yes. John Smythe and yeah. Jonathan Fletcher, yeah. uh, where they would uh, molest and uh, mm. uh, beat these poor boys. Sure. Um, and we had that here in America with the Boy Scouts. 
you know, uh, some uh, uh, treacherous people got into leadership in the Boy Scouts uh, in the Northeast and in the Northwestern America and used it as the ability to, to molest boys. And it, it, it's horrible. Um, there, there's a great evil that wants to attack our children and wants to, to reteach our children what is important. And right now, what is important uh, from Satan's mouth to my mouth be the best person you can be. So, that's what's important. Hmm. Well, boy, we're getting into some big topics here, George. Big stuff here. Um, but you're right about Lambeth 110. They don't want people who were at the table when it was put on paper to to speak in defense of it. But no, it doesn't mean that. No, it really does. Uh, well, we had going back to our very going back to our very first story. That was the value. On one level of Drexel Gomez, yep. having been a bishop for 50 years, mm -hmm. he had the memory. He could go to these meetings and had been to the prior meeting and the one 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And we're not seeing that anymore. We're, no. uh, and that's why in Kingston, Jamaica, he is the one who stood up in the middle of the, uh, of the meeting and said, stop changing the rules when we're trying to vote on whether or not we're going to have a covenant in paragraph four. He stood up and said, stop. This isn't this isn't right. This is you know, you introduce us to this this these uh what's this, the, the rule is called? Oh man. Uh, Canons? Procedures? No, 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 no. The, yeah, the procedure. What's it called when you have those uh the rules? Robert's rules. Robert's board. rules. Oh my gosh. So Robert's rules. And he knew Robert's rules, and all of a sudden, Rowan Williams and the leadership of the uh ACC there on the ground in Kingston, Jamaica, were changing the rules because Drexel Gomez knew how to use them. He was he was in institutionally intelligent, and he, they changed it right in front of his eyes. He goes, "What happened? What happened? A second ago, we were going to approve paragraph four of the covenant, and now it's missing. It's going back to some committee. That's wrong. <laughs> so so uh, we need more Drexel Gomez's absolutely." Uh, but that's our institutional memory, George, of, of what's happened over time. Uh, we are going to talk about my least favorite topic. Uh, there has been a shooting at an Episcopal church in Alabama. Uh, people were killed, people were shot, and a uh, gunman was uh, beaten to a pulp. Let's talk about it, George. Yeah, a week ago Thursday, uh, yeah, last yeah. Thursday, a uh, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Vestavia Hills, which is a suburb of Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Nice, big, suburban Episcopal Church. Um, not in gangland, not in the inner city, mm -hmm. not out in the countryside, far away from people. Well, they were holding a boomer's potluck. And at this boomer's potluck, they had about two dozen people. And I just want to get this guy's name right in That's my right. mind. Mm -hmm. uh, they were have, holding a boomer's potluck, began at five o'clock, and this fellow came in, an uh, older fellow in his 70s, he said his name was Smith. And some of the people remembered seeing him at the Good Friday service, but he was not a regular at the church, not a parishioner by any sort. And he sort of sat off to one side, an older fellow, a man named Walter, uh, Walt, walked over him, invited him to his table. The man said, no, I'd rather sit here by myself. And at 622, according to the police report, he got up, pulled out a gun and began to shoot. He uh, killed Walt. He killed another woman and he killed a woman who was critically injured, who died in hospital that night. Uh, 70 uh, men in his 70s got up and took a church folding chair and whacked him across the head and face, pummeled him and knocked his gun out of his hand and held him until police arrived. And the man is now, his man named Smith. Uh, Smith is uh, in jail, no bond for capital murder. And we still don't know his motive, uh, but it was one of these things that, uh, you know, he let, he let loose, you know, three shot, three, four shots. Um, it wasn't a hostage situation where he had an hour like in Ovalde, te Mexic Texas. Yeah. He basically started letting loose and a man got up and immediately stopped him, mm -hmm. uh, disarmed him with physical force. Sure. Um, 
terrible, terrible thing. No, uh, evil, evil is terrible. And we, we're going to see it more and more in different forms. Uh, evil is, is terrible in how it's being introduced to our uh, school children. It is transgendered studies and uh, uh, gender therapy in our schools. Evil is um, uh, horrible in how it, it's being influenced now through inflation. Evil is uh, horrible in how it results sometimes in gun violence. Evil is horrible in many different forms. And I watch this and uh, I thank God that people are willing now to stand up and say, hell no, and throw a chair at this guy. And you're not, not here because we are, I don't know how many years out, but this is the anniversary weekend where the nine people were shot in Charleston. You know, yeah, presiding Bishop Michael Curry was on his way to Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church for a uh, prayer service to, to mark that anniversary. And he released a statement asking us to pray for all those suffering from violence, gun violence, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, some Episcopal leaders have immediately jumped on the political bandwagon and are talking about gun control and this and that. Um, if I were to jump on a bandwagon here, I would think it'd be mental illness. Oh, um, gosh, yeah. uh, you know, our mental illness facilities are so poor in this country and our monitoring and care for those, you know, who live on the streets or have uh, psychotic illnesses is such that uh, these things will happen. You know, but if he had a knife, he would have killed that many people until somebody disarmed him. Um, it, it's amazing what the press will focus on and how we lose our perspective. Uh, this weekend, or this week, or last weekend, whenever, uh, Joe Biden was on a bike ride and he crashed his bike uh, in the middle of a street. Uh, I've done that once before, it's very embarrassing. And um, got up, but it was, it was the bicycle accident heard around the world. The press were swooning that first of all, there was an 80 guy, year old guy on a bicycle, but you know, he's not hurt, he's up, he brushed himself off and he, he went on his merry way. Well, I'm gonna put this in perspective because I try to go bicycling every day. You are more likely to die on your bicycle than be involved in a shooting. You, you're a thousand times more likely to, a thousand times, one thousand times more likely to die on your bicycle than to be involved in a mass shooting where three or four people are shot. You are three thousand times more likely to die on your bicycle than to be shot by an assault weapon. The, 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 the math proportions here are just so skewed. However, bicycle accidents don't make the news anymore. And I was involved in one. I had a head on with a, with a, uh, a car, September 11th, 2017, 19. And it is a traumatic event. Um, I survived on pain pills. Uh, but uh, you know, th the reality is we lose our focus because we draw our attention away from the evil, away from the situation, away from the statistics, away from the math, because there's something tangible we can blame. We can blame the gun. Now, the first person that I, in my life, who died tragically, her name was Beth, and this is back in high school, uh, right after high school, she was killed by a drunk driver. In the nation in the United States of America, drunk driving kills more people than guns. Do we focus on it? Yeah, we did in the 80s. When she was killed, there was a focus. Uh, of nightly news, the drunk drivers, the, the situation happening in America, how do we stop people from getting behind the wheel? Um, well, it was never mentioned that we take away the damn car. Uh, the person who hit Beth had three convictions as a drunk driver. Uh, Beth was actually a waitress at the bar that he was served at that night, and she was walking home to go to the bus stop, and he got in his car completely blasted and ran her over. And that's evil in my eyes that's as evil as a gun crime um but here we are you know 20 30 years later and the car is not a tangible thing we're going to attack but a gun will be damn it all so 
you know, it, we have to put things in perspective and we have to identify the evil, not just the objects. And it, it's, it, you know, until we can do that and know what is evil and what is not evil, uh, we will fail as a church and we'll certainly fail as a nation. Uh, and this is not a pro gun. This is not a pro gun talk. I am not pro gun. I'm pro Second Amendment. I am uh, pro responsibility, and I am pro. You know, keep your eyes on the target. Make the church be about what the church should be. Make the Constitution about what the Constitution should be, and don't let the press take you off on little squirrel trails in telling you what's going on. Our country has changed, though, uh, regards to guns. When I was in high school, uh, I took a shotgun to school because oh, I was yeah. on the shooting team. Yeah. Uh, we had a team that shot skeet. There was a rifle team. And, you know, there are you know, a dozen boys, 14, 15, 16, with shotguns. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember any massacre. Well, there was no, there were no <laughs> massacres. Um, yeah. Uh, but that was what 40 50 years ago yeah. not 50 but 40 odd years ago yeah. uh 35 years ago 1978 my dad and i went to an nra class at the local high school uh, i took dad's 30 odd six one massive deer gun yeah more massive than any assault weapon you've ever seen show up at uh uh your, your little walmart shootings here and I learned to shoot there. They taught me gun safety there. I came back to get my deer hunting license there a couple uh, years later. I shot a 30 odd six at a target in the gymnasium. That was the biggest boom you've ever heard. <laughs> and it was, you know, and um, it's completely different now. Not because guns have become more dangerous, it's because we stopped raising our children, and that became more dangerous. We have broken homes. The statistics are amazingly bad. And Donald Moynihan wrote a, uh, a big report back in the 70s about this, how we're going to lose the black family, we're going to lose the white family, we're going to lose the Latino family because of the destruction of the family, because America no longer values the family. And ever since that um, um, report he wrote, and it got a lot of... Uh, pushback because it's, it's all racist well it was all racist until uh, Jesse James and Obama and other people started repeating the same thing that was in that report that we're gonna lose America uh, because we're losing the family we've lost the black family we're, we're losing the white family we're gonna uh, I, th I think the Latino family will stay a little stronger longer uh, the Asian family we'll see but we've lost our family structures and now the biggest story is not that we have mass shootings it's that we have fatherless mass shooters. Look at who these kids are. They don't have fathers. They, had, they were raised in, in single families, some in foster care situations. And then all of a sudden we, we have angry teenagers uh, who've grown up in the internet age and we give them access to guns. And what do you think is going to happen? What? So, not a pro gun talk. This is a get real talk, you know. It, for those who are interested in Kevin's back, it, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, late New York senator, uh, did those seminal studies in the 60s and early 70s about the family. And it's always worth looking back at those. Uh, absolutely. He was right. Um, we've lost the family. We have no fault divorce. And until we can um, repatriate uh, the, you know, just use the nuclear family, the God-given family, the, the, the family spoke about in the New Testament um, and, and praised as worthy. Until we can reconstitute that as something that's desirable, um, you will not have a day where we don't have mass shooters. T and taking away the guns won't stop. I, I'm sorry, it won't. Uh, especially in, in the environment here in America. Uh, well, let, let's be specific because some people will hit back say, well, when we took away guns in England, we had no more mass shootings. Yeah. Has that stopped? Has that stopped stabbings? Has no, that, or, in other words, have people turned to other methods to 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 well, harm okay. and express their anger at the world? Well, in in fairness to the population, uh, Europe is is different than America. 
we are here in America a powder keg of many different nations, many different tribes. Uh, the makeup of uh, England, the makeup of France, the makeup of all, all the different countries there is a different makeup and ethos. Uh, and we were founded in the, the line of the frontiersmen, where you were, you stayed where you wanted to stay. <laughs> you know, your ancestors uh, were not the explorers, the people who were willing to, to leave your country with two pennies in your pocket and try something new somewhere else. Uh, there are countries where you have been able to take away the guns of the bad people as well. Okay. Uh, Australia is a great example of a culture where you were able to finally uh, take away guns from good and bad people. And I would fully attest that um, you don't have any good rights anymore down in Australia, but uh, the gun problem you had, it's taken care of. The freedom problem remains. <laughs> you don't have any freedom. Uh, and, you know, you can look at statistics all you want and you find towns in america that have the most guns per capita are the safest except chicago legal guns legal guns you know they're they've done stats in little towns around atlanta where the legal gun ownership is a hundred percent crime rate is you can't there's still crime rate the crime rate is when somebody left a nail on the road and somebody got a flat that's a crime in some of these towns in uh, in Georgia. And, you know, it is what it is. But I, I don't want to give a pro-gun speech here. I want to be sure that you identify the evil. Because you can't buy anti-gun or pro-gun until you know what evil is. And in our society, we've completely forgot what evil is. You know, the C.S. Lewis used to say, uh, Satan's greatest uh, uh, trick was to convince us he doesn't exist. Well, no. I think it's due... Uh, uh, trick the greatest trick is to convince us we don't know what gender we are to convince us that confusion is good that diversity is power and diversity is uh our unity you know no we need to go back and, and rediscover what evil is rediscover what good is rediscover holiness and righteousness and for crying out loud it'd be really nice if the church would teach the real jesus again i miss the real well, the jesus. church yeah the church may not but christians do and we know the answer. We've seen it work. We've seen lives changed. You and I have seen lives changed on all these issues we've talked about today. Sure. Yeah. We've seen people who are bitter, angry, broken by their upbringing, by the world, come to a place of peace in their own life, with their own selves, through the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, people tease me, or maybe they're not teasing me. They get annoyed when I smile when you talk about terrible things. It's not because I think it's funny, but because I know that in Christ we have the solution to these problems. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be those solutions may not arrive in my time or according to my demands, but Jesus is the answer, and we just have to hold fast and keep plugging that, plugging that thought. Mm -hmm. You want to get us out of this mess? Support the family, bring them to church, seek out in worship the transformational Jesus and when you find him share him it's real simple y you can't get this wrong you can't I'm Kevin Coulson and I'm George Conger and you've been watching episode 300 and 737 of Anglican Unscripted